Uh, just give me a second, I'm just watching my dashboard over here, making sure something happens. Just give me a second, there we go. Good, okay, welcome, hello. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Live Ed Edits. Welcome to another stream. Um, what I was doing there was looking at how um, how far the delay is between Twitch's display and YouTube's display. It's like YouTube has like a good five second delay on top of Twitch. Interesting. It also said I was streaming at um, zero kilobits a second for my audio quality, which was concerning. So I was waiting to hear myself say something um, but that's all good and everything is just fine everything is is lovely everything is good so how are, how are you early early stream participants hello sick building up that hype which i was gently encouraging via discord <laughs> good to see you again um have i got anything interesting to start off the stream with? yes you can um follow along with this story that we're going to be working here tonight with but if you're tuning uh, tuning in via twitch you can also have a, a look at the document there um we're going to be doing something interesting tonight it's a anonymous wolverine nice um i made a rule um Fairly early on, which I've I've stuck to consistently, I never never really had an opportunity to break, um, and that rule was I I would never edit another person's published work uh, unless they themselves asked me to do it, like if it was a short story or something. But I've always thought to myself that it's it's somewhat in poor taste to go over somebody else's published story and go, no, this is wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, I would have done it this way. Um, it's a bit on the nose, I think. And so when um, Emma the Ruthless sent over this, this request to do tonight, um, I'll see if I can find her actual words. What she, was, what she was saying about this story and what she wanted to get out of it, um, I thought it was quite interesting. So I'll, I'll read out the little spiel that was sent over. Uh, the book was, this book was published in the 1970s. It's called This Other Eden, and it forms part of a historical romance trilogy, I think. Um, she says uh, she really likes the way that the author describes the, hero, the heroine's predicament in this particular scene, in the opening scene. She was mostly an alone, the, the MC here, the main character. She was mostly alone and interacting with her environment, which is a dungeon of some sort. Uh, I was wondering how you'd edit this for contemporary readers. I think there are a couple of lines where the author uses an omniscient point of view, which has fallen out of favour in, in recent reading, I, I think. Um, I really want to know how to write like this and not rely on dialogue to make the character come alive. Again, that's, a, that's an older style of, of writing. Um, and then she, she relates it back into her own story, which, uh, which I edited on Liabird Edits. That was, um, the story with, um, with Jordan, who was, um, uh, had like a sort of supernatural connection with her, I think it was her husband, uh, or at the very least it was a ghost in, inside her house. So that was Emma's story, and she wants to see how this kind of writing here can, I suppose, influence her writing and, um, in the way that it's that this story here is is written now i was thinking that it would just be interesting because of the the time difference between now and 1977 that's um that's a big amount of time what's well, it's 41 years is my maths really bad or did i did i get that right no i think that's right it's 41 years um which is quite remarkable when you think about it so I think what I'll be doing tonight is going through this story and not editing it in the way that I would edit another story that was a draft. I think tonight what I'll be doing is looking more at, um, I'll make it a little bigger again. 
I want to examine how stories have changed and what we consider to be different ways of telling stories in a modern sense versus what 1977 was, was looking like. I think tonight we'll do a lot less line by line editing. Um, in fact, I don't, I don't particularly want to do any line by line editing because um, that, that's the type of editing I don't think is appropriate to do on another person's work. But I think we can talk about the story in a bit of a general sense in its development, how the narrative progresses, how the characters are introduced, um, how the narrator um, interfaces with the events of the story, what kind of word choices are used, how metaphors are presented. Um, even sort of small grammatical things we can we can pick up on and, and have a look at. I'm going to go 125% zoom. Let me know if that's too small. Um, so in total here there are how many pages? Uh, how many words? I think it was 1,700. So yeah, yeah, 1,700 words. And this forms the opening part of this story, this other Eden. Now, I put the link on YouTube uh, in the description of the video. But for Twitch, here it is. This is the book. And it's got a... It's got a I mean, for, for a book that is, what, 40 plus years old. Um, and with 794 total ratings, I think that's a pretty a pretty solid score. 3.76 out of 5. It's a historical romance, historical fiction, and I've never never really looked at one of these stories before in this particular genre, so um, I guess I'll be a little out of my, my depth in terms of um, my familiarity with it. I'm familiar with, with historical fiction, but certainly not historical romance. So it'd be interesting. Um, yeah, and that's what we'll be doing tonight. We'll just be going through and having a, a little a little chat about the story. It may not even be... Um, a complete... I'm, I'm not sure how, how long I'll go for tonight. Hopefully about an hour and a half. We'll see. That's an interesting point about the romance cover. Yeah. It's sort of like a Les Mis painting almost. Um, <laughs> a Les Mis painting. What am I saying? Um, that, like that... Um, the painting that's really... Uh, typical of like the French Revolution era. You know that like the... the Viva Le Viva painting. Like that, that is just like French Revolution full stop. Me, I call it the Le, the Les Mis painting. It's not the Les Mis painting at all. It's it's um related, but it's not the same thing. Um, large cover. It's a cool cover. Um, but yeah, that's quite different from what we've got going on today, actually. Yeah, really different. <laughs> I love it. Alrighty then. Well, let's just have a little check of the... Nice. Alrighty, it is... Three, three bots and two viewers. Welcome, bots. Hello. Beep, boop, beep. <laughs> bots. Twitter bots. Twitter bots? Twitch bots. What are we on? Twitch. Actually, on Discord last night, um, Sayaka, so stupid anime girl, mentioned that Bethesda had their um, the Twitch channel was teasing something. To, I think it's a new Fallout, but it wasn't a, a remake, which I think everyone was surprised about. <laughs> bots, bots of people too, yes. It, maybe in the future, not, not right now. We, we have a bit of a way to go with Android rights. Okay, well, I reckon we, we pop right in. 
Again, let me know if um, if you'd like to have this enhanced, if you'd like the text to be a little bigger. Otherwise, I'm going to read out, I guess, uh, a chunk of the opening section. Just where I, where I feel like it should stop. Chapter 1, Eden Castle, North Devon, England, 1790. The public whipping of Miss Marianne Locke, age 16, was scheduled to take place at 7 in the morning on Friday, August the 3rd, 1970 in the inner courtyard of Eden Castle, situated on the North Devon coast at the exact point where the Bristol Channel prepares to join the turbulence of the Atlantic Ocean. The cliffs veered sharply forward from this point, fronting the unbroken force of the Atlantic winds and waves, and were shattered by them into a grim array of jutting points. Here, the gales and ocean were supreme, but atop the cliffs of Eden Point, supremacy resided in human hands, and the command for the public whipping, considered barbaric for the civilised late 18th century, had been issued by Thomas Eden himself, 13th Baron and 5th Earl. Thomas Eden possessed the power and had suffered the outrage. So, on a hot, humid Thursday afternoon, he shouted at Rangland, his male servant, whip her. As his anger showed no signs of abating, he added, publicly. And all those who fail to witness it may also find themselves in her unfortunate position. The whipping had been announced to all the tenants and fishermen of Mortemouth, or Mortemouth? The village that sat at sea level at the foot of Eden Castle. These people were totally dependent upon the lord of the castle and his 20,000 acres of rich sheep grazing land. The prisoner was led by Ragland into the keep through the Norman doorway. She found herself imprisoned in a small, windowless room, barely able to breathe. She waited for Ragland to, st to say something to her, acknowledging the many evenings he had shared a pint with her father in their cottage in Mortemouth. But the old man refused to look at her. He kept his hand over his nose to shield against the poisonous vapours of a, of a uh, charnel house? Carnal house? Um, and he kept his white head bowed. Only when he was closing the heavy door behind him did she hear him mutter, Keep close to the floor, Marianne. There's life there. The breathing's easier. The door closed, the bolts slid into place. In terror and despair, she hurled herself at the solid oak barrier. Slowly sensing her predicament, she sank to the floor, still struggling for breath. A series of almost invisible shudders passed over her, over her mouth and down into her shoulders and arms. The spasm of waking moved upward from some deep, shocked realm. She closed her eyes and then opened them. Instantly she tried to get to her feet, but fell back into a pose of annihilation. From this stunned state, she observed her surroundings, a small room of solid stone. On the floor nearby was a pile of straw reeking with the odour of urine and faeces, and there, in the far corner, the pit itself. Is that, a, is that an M or an R? It's an M. The deep hole of the carnal well descending 30 feet into the level of the courtyard outside. The place where the rotting carcasses of cattle and sheep were thrown, from which the stench of putrefaction arose to asphyxiate any prisoner long held in the room. Now I'm going to stop there and check something. <clears throat> this book seems to have been republished several times over the years so there's a 2017 version I'm, I'm on Amazon right now um, right there's a 2017 version
Hmm. Um, that that typo isn't in the Amazon description. I I, I don't know. I don't, don't know why they bothered me so much. Because some, sometimes R's and M's can look really... Like if you look at it, if you squint R and N from afar, it looks like an M. So I was I was thinking, is that coma or coma? Anyway. Yes, I think it's on KU as well. They did. Isn't isn't the new cover just um it's not it's not fantastic. Um I mean like I I don't want to pass too much judgment, but um This is the um this is the cover of the new the new republished version. It's very romancy, isn't it? It's very um kinda, you know, stock photo, stock background. Whereas the other cover um, is is that. So it has a, a sort of more painterly quality, but you know this is pretty typical of of pulp publications in the past as well. So, um, you know, I wonder if in, in forty years' time we're going to look back on this and be like, "Ooh, it's vintage. It's nice. It's almost got like a like a sort of flash quality to it, doesn't it?" Mm -mm. And all the boffins will go, "Oh, yes, it's very typical of the uh, early two thousand and seventeen's literature." Um, yeah, I wonder. Anyway. Enough about covers. I prefer the old one. Um, wow, it's different from from what you'd expect a modern story to be, right? Mm. Yes, stock stock art cover. Um, it, it, mm. <laughs> mm, mm. There's there's a funny thing about book covers and and stock art as as well. You sort of have to um. Especially if you're writing romance, you need to to have that look. You you know the the romance fiction book look. It's however it's pretty crucial to to get that look because when you're marketing your story, you need to make your audience aware very quickly of the kind of story you've written. So I guess that's why it has that kind of look. You know what I mean? Like the stock cover romance look. That and, um, you know, a lot of romance authors probably don't need to spend huge amounts of money to make a, a bespoke cover for their story, especially if they're not selling it for any anything above 99 cents. It's uh, it, it's all played to market, I guess. And, um, uh, you know, that's a whole other series of considerations that go beyond editing and beyond revising your work. Um, that's That's marketing. Hmm. Does that excuse me? Yeah. My gosh, it's different. You sort of read through something like this, and there are elements of it where uh, I'll choose a color. Hmm. 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 Mm. Dark purple. So there are points in this story where things are just outright told to you. They're they're declared to you. The, the narrator is a. I have no idea who the narrator is. They seem to exist in this sort of godlike. Um. Crane, toy crane, they, I'm, I'm not sure if that metaphor carries. Um, they have like a bird's eye perspective of, of all the events of the story, which is why they can start off with, with paragraphs like this, which are tiny, tiny little paragraphs. This is a sentence. Um, uh, it's a huge sentence. Um, but what it serves to do is ground this story in in a manner that's very factual, and this isn't all the style of doing things. If if you were to rewrite the story, I mean, that's that's a whole other thing that I can talk about a bit later. First of all, let's go through and do some highlighting of areas where um, 
the the narrator tells us detail instead of showing it to us now that's a huge part of modern writing you know it's it's the basic mantra of narrative fiction is you you display your detail in a way that demonstrates its presence rather than just being like oh yeah this is this is here so um this this is 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 almost out of place in modern writing so let's highlight it with that the cliffs veered sharply southward uh, excuse me i'm going to choose a little lighter color the cliffs veered sharply southward, so we've got an L-Y there, um, which I'm going to highlight as green. Um, fronting the unbroken force of the Atlantic and was shattered by jutting points, here the gales and oceans are supreme. I like how the author does supreme and supremacy here. It's um, it's kind of quaint, um, and I, I don't know, I, I, I sort of like it, but um, I top the cliffs of Eden Point, human hands in the command. Uh, it's been issued a huge title. Wow. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so here's another point at which um, a lot of detail is 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 told to us. Um, these people were totally dependent upon the lord of the castle and his twenty thousand acres of rich grazing, rich sheep grazing land. Um, this detail too is also told. I want to give a little space there just to, um, yeah. <laughs> you just like the supreme supremacy. I, I've got a real soft spot for it. It's, um, yeah. It really, it really should be in the same paragraph, though, for it to work a bit better. But, I mean, that's that's neither here nor there. It's a style thing. Um, I'd even go so far as to say that this section here at the front outright tells you the detail. Now, it's a little different because you... You'd have trouble demonstrating this kind of detail using the same narrative style. This omnipresent, omnipotent narrator that will probably not omnipotent, but omnipresent narrator that we've got that sits above the story and dictates down into it allows the narrator to get a get away with doing this, so to speak. But really what this is doing is just establishing the facts of the story. However, then we, we go into, hey, by the way, the clips are really nice. Um, and so this, this detail used to be quite, um, I, I think it used to sort of help establish the setting, the mood, and the character of the location. But we really don't do this now, do we? We... We'll try and keep keep our descriptions focalized away from the narrator and focalized around a character. So we would only get this information if the character was privy to it, or if it was really important. Excuse me. But it's here and it's like this, I think, because it it functions with the how the narrator is going. Now, just touch on touch on one thing that sparked Emma's interest in this story. I'll go back to the email. She said, um, I really want to know how to write like this and not rely on dialogue to make the character come alive. So that's probably going to come a little later here because we're first introduced to the character in a movement, physical sense, here, the prisoner was led by Ragland into the keep through the Norman doorway. I don't know what a Norman doorway is. Uh, she found herself in prison in a small windows room, barely able to breathe. Uh, is also declarative. She waited for Ragland to say something, acknowledging her. Um, this is interesting. This is a detail that's...
given to us from the narrator, from the narrator's omniscience. It's not quite a show, and it's not quite a tell. I don't know what to call it, because the modern paradigm for this doesn't really exist. It's a very sort of epic fantasy style of, of telling a story, isn't it? Often if you're reading epic fantasy, you have this, um, this narrator who's at every opportunity just champing at the bit to tell you these little tidbits of information, and um, it sort of reminds me of that a bit. It's a narrative device, and I don't know quite what to call it. But the old man refused to look at her. He kept his hand over his nose to shield against the poisonous vapours. We don't get a real description of what this is until the pit, and I think I we intuitively come back and understand what it is. So that's that's good. I like that. I like um, details where you you're introduced to something that you don't know, and then you pick up the detail later on. That's what I really like about this section here. You get the sense too that he's not entirely his rage here, which the narrator declared to us. Doesn't seem to carry through with his action here, does it? That's important to note. Um, so the the crux of his story starts here. The prisoner's led into a room. He says. Um, there's life he there. Oh, as in, like, if you keep to the floor, you will you will keep alive. Um, she gets overwhelmed a bit. She realizes where she is. Um, for, so I'm going to read on a bit more now. Focusing on the hole, her face went rigid. This is the channel hole. The foul air burned her lungs, then her terror blended with a curious relief. Since she had certain knowledge that she would never endure the pain and humiliation of the public whipping, she would not survive the night. Hmm. She pressed closer to the door, still keeping her eyes on the channel well, as though it were alive. She remembered, although she did not relish gossip, about three weeks prior, shortly after she had climbed the cliff staircase to take her place in service at Dean Castle, that she had been warned by the house warden, Dolly Wisdom, to stay away from the keep. The serving women in the buttery had told her a Cornwellian caught stealing sheep had been thrown still alive down the channel well on top of the riding carcasses. For a week thereafter, Marianne thought she had heard shrieks of death. She watched her hand ascend to her mouth as though both belonged to someone else. She felt a long, slow convulsion in the pit of her stomach. Only at the last moment, threatened with unconsciousness, did she remember the old Raglan's voice, keep close to the floor, there's life there. In spite of her torture, she flattened herself against the stone floor. Her nose pressed against the hairline crack beneath the heavy door. It was true. She found, coming from beneath the door, a brief respite. Thus she lay with no sense of time, her body pressed against the crack. In an extreme act of will, she soothed herself. If the man had indeed been thrown into the world, he would blessedly be dead by now. The eyes in, the back, in her back had nothing to worry about. Ah, so he couldn't climb up and, ooh, spooky, grab her. Yeah, I, I think I know what that, that sentence means. But the flesh of her back did. For she had decided that she would not survive the night, that at seven o'clock the following morning she would still be here, that she would be led out into the inner courtyard to the whipping oak, would have her back bared, and would endure ten lashes and the greater pain of sober observance by people who had known her all of her life. The eyes in her back had nothing to worry about, but the flesh of her back did, for she had decided that she, that she would survive the night at seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, yep, got it. Imagining the coming ordeal was more terrifying than the resurrection of the rotting corn Wellian, suddenly she tasted blood on her lips. The natural stress of image 
becoming fact. The natural stress of image becoming fact. Ah, the, the blood on her back. She sent her thoughts elsewhere to the headlands along the top of Eden Point where she had run as a child taking bread and cheese to her father at sheep shearing time to her roses which, by general consensus, were the prettiest in all of Mortimer, to the grave of her dead mother in the tiny parish churchyard by the quay. Now this is interesting, isn't it? Because the detail here, look, we've got headlands. Um, mm. uh, sheep shearing time. Mm. What before read as a little confusing in terms of, um, uh, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, I can't get ahead of myself just yet. Here's a reference to Eden Castle along the Climb the Cliffs staircase. Now remember at the very start of the story we have this thing here. The cliffs veered sharply southward, fronting the unbroken force of the Atlantic wind and waves. Um, here. So we've got the cliffs. And, and at first pass, all of this information, to me, as a modern reader, becomes kind of like, oh, uh, I don't really get why we're starting here. Why these cliffs are important. Why, like, I need to know right now about Eden Point. Um, I don't really understand as well why we're being told it's rich sheep grazing country. But then if you go out a little bit, not that zoomy, 50%. Uh, can you do side by side in Google Docs? View. Uh, yes, mode. Oh, you, you can't do like a word side by side thing. That's interesting. But look, the start of a story, sorry it's so small, I'm doing this for a reason. You have your, your pink de detail here that's a bit odd, oddly placed. And yet, the more you read into the story, the more it's referenced. Now, a modern way of doing this would be simply to just, as it comes up, you describe it. So, for example, let's go back to here. This paragraph here would most likely read a bit differently if it was modern. <laughs> Hello, Saika. Yes, I'm, I'm still going. I only just, I only just started. I've been, um, 37 minutes. Yes, I, I have, I have taken a break since when I last stopped my stream and I, I now continued my stream. I haven't been streaming consistently. Put what away? Zyka, are you, you're not talking about my, my precious fart gun cup, are you? My, my treasured possession, my, my, um, my one, oh look, on the other side there's another one. It's different. I've got two of them and in case you get bored, there's one, I don't know what you're referring to, I think you're referring to my, my, my cup. I hope you're referring to my cup. My cup is, is wonderful. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, so tonight... Um... Say a cut. Um, head over to Discord, or if you can scroll back up through chat. Now, head on to Discord and you'll be... Um, you can pop into this document and just have a, have a read of it at your own leisure. What we're doing tonight is a bit different. We're not editing a user story. We're looking at a story that someone else published in the past, back in 1977. This is at the request of Emma the Ruthless, who sent this over to me. She was saying, I want to know how I can write a story similar to this in a way that talks about the character and focalizes through the character without having to rely on excessive dialogue. So. I think the more I read through it, that she's talking about paragraphs like this. Um, 
brief recap of the story. We've got an Earl who's cranky, and for whatever cranky reason, he he decided that this this uh, sixteen year old um, Miss Marianne Locke, who I think uh, is the daughter of one of the Earl's friends, is going to be lashed publicly. I don't know why, and we don't know why yet. Um, she's taken by the Earl into a cell. The cell has a particularly smelly well on the other, like on, in, in one of the corners where old animal carcasses are, are dropped. Um, so a lot of this story focuses on her, well, by a lot, I mean like the part that we've read, uh, focuses a lot on her experience inside the cell. And I think Evan was talking about how do you write like this where you can talk about the character and about their past like this paragraph here, without having to resolve to dialogue. So what we're doing tonight isn't so much editing or um, looking at a published story and going, oh, this is wrong, that's wrong, we wouldn't do it like this. I think what we're doing tonight is more like a sort of... Um, like an examination of, of how writing styles change. And in doing so, we can probably have a look at what was in favour back then, and maybe learn some interesting things that we can apply to our own writing now in the modern sense about how character information is revealed, that sort of thing. Next game, the, the, the video game, right? Although, is it one of those narrative video games? It's also a film. Um... Someone recommended Max Payne to me. Does it have like a narrative element to it? I'm not sure. I don't remember. Anyway. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Cool. A game but a graphic novel. Hmm. All right, so what I notice here, um, especially in... I'll do with this paragraph first because that's probably the most useful so far. And then we'll go back into the descriptions of what she's feeling. There are two elements here. There's, there's the, the visceral sense of how she is inside the cell, which is this all the way up to like here, pretty much. With a little bit of background information. But this is the first paragraph where she, ah, uh, this one and this one too, um, and we'll we'll deal with these ones first with the with the pink inside. She pressed closer to the, to the door, still keeping her eyes on the on the channel well as though it were alive. She remembered, although she did not relish gossip, that three weeks prior, shortly after she had climbed the cliff staircase to take her place in service at Eden Castle, that she had been warned by the house warren, Dolly Wisdom, to stay away from the keep. The serving woman in the buttery had told her a Cornwellian had been caught stealing sheep. Um, we learn that through little snippets like this, although she did not relish gossip, and perhaps even... Um, Climb the cliff staircase. So there are two points here in this paragraph. Make a comment sort of. We get a. In this paragraph, we get a sense of our main characters. How to, how to put it? Perception. As well as a really small snippet of her own personality. Although brief, it's one of the most direct statements so far about who this lady is. 
Continuing on from that, we've got, um... She sent her thoughts elsewhere. Again, here, the character chooses, well, it's really the narrator, the, the narrator chooses to project the focalization of the story through the MC and out into the world via a memory. So it's sort of like we start off here as the narrator as a bird's eye and we swoop into the character and then get in her head and then mess around in the images in there. It's, it's a very sort of flowy kind of focalization. Um, here we get the sense of her but like in factual detail. Although it's never demonstrated or showy. It's the author's I didn't spell author correctly, it needs a U. Uh, the author's way of imparting <sighs> That was what one thing Emma was, was interested in is how how to talk about a character without using dialogue. Interesting idea. Maybe. Hmm. Now the second thing that I noticed about these passages here. So, how does the author choose to talk about their character without using dialogue or using, um, grand overarching memories as scenes. Um, the first thing they do is they use little snippets of scenes, they sort of do it on, on a micro scale. Without really declaring, it, 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 sorry, no, with, with declaring, it's still quite declarative in terms of how, it's, how the statements are formed. The other thing to note here is that the, the character is reacting viscerally to being placed in this situation. The door closed, the bolts slid into place. In terror and despair, she hurled herself at the solid oak barrier. So... This is a way in which the narrator slash author is choosing to show you character detail without dialogue. How's the narrator doing it? Well, it's in... in... demonstrating how she reacts to difficult situations in a real, physical, visceral sense. You get an understanding... So for example, how she reacts to being locked in this cell tells you that she's brave, quiet, despondent, hopeful, anything. Does does she curl up in a ball, bang her fists on the wall, look out the window, etc. These physical 
markers can tell you can make the character come alive. If you choose to write with this um missient POV, then there's almost little else you can do. And this is it's an effective way. So even within older style stories where we tend to think of um, people used to tell more than they showed, yeah, sure, that's like evident in the in this story and the fact that it's forty one years old. Um, but even so, the narrator very rarely outright tells you a a personality trait. They won't say so and so, brave, smart, and the fastest runner in all of Scotland. Um, they'll never do that. They'll they'll talk that way about cliffs and about maybe the Earl and his um, penchant for animal animal husbandry. But um, when it comes to characters and their personalities, I haven't so far in this story seen a point where the narrator has gone, um, not one to give up so lightly. She did X Y Z. Um, Instead, we get these quite factual paragraphs that talk about her, vis her, her um, visceral reactions. A series of almost invisible shadows passed over her, over her mouth, and down into her shoulders and arms. A spasm of waking moved upward from some deep, shocked realm. She closed her eyes and then opened them. Instantly, she tried to get to her feet, but she fell back in a pose of annihilation. So it's very dramatic. It's very... Um, by modern standards, it's quite purple. I, I don't really know what this is, um, and, and why it needs to be told this way. A spasm of waking moved upward from some deep shocked realm. It's like, I, I, I like it, it's cool, but um, in a modern sense, I'm, I'm not sure if, if that would sort of fly. But that's not the point of what we're doing tonight. What we're looking at is how what this does um, contributes towards developing a character. Believe it or not, um, this flows into what I was saying before. So, this detail here to modern reader probably screams. Purple prose, um, it's unnecessary, um, overly declarative, um, overdrawn, etc. All sorts of nasty descriptions that, that we give it. The point, however, isn't that this isn't the way to write in a modern sense. Rather, look at how... Hmm. Oh, one second. Alrighty. 
Yeah, as I as I said before, like we're not we're not necessarily going through this with a modern frame and going like, oh, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Like you, you can look at, at lines like this and go, okay, well, you know, if this was a modern story, we'd suggest reworking it. Well, what we're going to focus on instead is um, uh, look at how the narrator chooses to tell you details about their character. Again, don't worry about the showing versus telling, that's not what we're here for. Um, what does this say about the character? And how does it say it? A series of almost invisible shudders passed over her, over her mouth and down into her shoulders and arms. She gets this, this spasm, closes her eyes and opens them, she tries to get to her feet, falls back into a pose of annihilation. So, so this demonstrates to me that um, these, these series of quite uh, detailed physical responses tell me about how she processes these things and the fact that she's not processing it particularly well um you know she doesn't take the lotus position and and assume all calm she doesn't breathe deeply she doesn't try and center herself or ground herself um so the choices here the choices the character makes in response to their dire situation is showing you what they're like. So really, this is a very 70s way of showing, not telling. Not once here does the narrator say she is scared, she is petrified, she is mortified. Um, so yeah, I think that holds. Tr that when, I, when I said here holds true, it's a very seventies way of showing, not telling. <laughs> um, and for us as modern readers, we look at that and go, "Oh, hang on a second, it's just all tell." Well, it, it, probably from from our standards. But really, what it's doing when it's coupled with the first part of this paragraph here is it's priming you to understand something about the character. From this stunned state, she observed her surroundings, a small room of solid stone. So here we go. So she's, 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 uh, after the panic comes, comes the analytics. On the floor nearby was a pile of straw, unpleasant, and there in the far corner was a pit, um, and it's not very nice. Focusing on, on the hole, her face went rigid, um, and then she goes into despair, she would not survive the night. Um, this is this is quite a good way of um, the narrator really empathizing with the reader, sorry, with, with, the, with the character, in that it's borrowing a thought from her head and expelling it outwards, and then contradicting itself later on down the track. Um, when she says, uh, oh no, I'm going to survive, which uh, is... For well, she had decided that she would survive the night. Orange. Uh, she would not survive the night. Orange. So... Well, she had decided... I'm going to make a comment here. Did you notice that this orange and the orange on the last page contradict? I don't think it's unintentional. It's not unintentional. It's actually quite clever. It's actually quite a clever thing that the author has done to show you how the narrator is interfacing with the character. And how does that happen? The narrator has plucked the thought from the MC's head and projected it outwards as fact. It's a it, it's a tell, but a very useful one. But a very useful one that helps the reader understand that the narrator is there to help them to help guide them through the ground level detail as it happens. This is important because... 
Oh, I didn't lose my train of thought. Come on, come on, brain. Um, it's useful because um, this primes the reader. To absorb this detail not only as story fact but as character info. Those two bleed together, but what I mean by that is um, without a single word of dialogue and without a really well not a single word, but with, without dialogue, without the narrator outright telling you um that Miss Marianne, Marianne, uh, Marianne Locke is is a really smart, independent woman, um, and uh, and she's totally fine in this prison. What we've got here is 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 almost the complete opposite, um, but in a horseshoe sense. So the the opposite of all this would be demonstrating the detail as it comes, like um, uh, the character. Is thrown into the into the into the, the cellar or into the cell, um, and then the narrator goes into some descriptions of what the walls are like, the ooze coming from them. She'll then describe the, the narrator will then describe the body language of the main character. Um, Marianne huddled up in the corner as the chill ate into her flesh, and despite the fact that she you know covered her arms and, and shivered for warmth, there was a, a spectre of, of of icy coldness that cut through the stone. Something like that, whatever. But that's that's a modern way of describing what's going on here. What we've got instead is um, instead of like here's here's the narrator telling you that she's brave. Uh, here is a sh a modern show of like um, she bites her lip and looks to the window, thinking of a way of escape something like that, something that demonstrates her bravery. And then up here, again, in the, in the reverse side of the horseshoe, we've got, um, here's the, here's the physical detail of what is happening to Marianne right now. She's on her knees, she's shaking, um, there's a, a chasm of fear opening up inside of her, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this, and all of that detail combines to make it so that we understand more about the character from the way that this is told as a narrator. Yeah, R remember when like this is the common thing in in like high school English where um, I, I sort of feel like I'm really over analyzing all of this 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 writing. Um, and if if you go and ask the the author, did you mean to do this on page four when you wrote about these specific things? Were you trying to do like a reverse horseshoe kind of demonstrative blah blah blah? And the author would probably be like, nah, I was just writing. Um, I feel I feel like I'm now like the English teacher, um, where I'm I'm just I'm just talking. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think so, Psycho. And it makes a makes a uh, a real difference from last stream. That was hectic last stream. Good fun. But hectic. Um. Yeah, I don't think we'll be all that much longer on on this stream. We're about about halfway through it, and I don't imagine I could talk for all night about this. So I'm reckon maybe another half an hour. On that note, I may not be able to stream on Sunday. I'll let you guys know um, via an update over Discord and my Twitch dashboard. Um, hmm. <laughs> Rare liar bird without distractions. It's just it's just me talking an awful lot more, um, yeah, and rambling an awful lot more. I'll I'll get sidetracked more easily, maybe, <laughs> or maybe I don't I don't know. Like, maybe you you'll I'll just be really focused tonight. Who knows? Um, what was I gonna say about this? So yeah, just 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 to reiterate, what we're doing here isn't. Uh, I'm not trying to say that this is how you should write, and I'm also not saying that this is not how you should write. I think what I'm doing here is, in a sense, sort of justifying the way that this is, and looking at how it's written, and trying to make sense of what it's telling me as, as a reader. Now, 
uh, and as a writer too, is it the most effective way to tell a story? Um, well, I mean, maybe, maybe not. Um, but, uh, that's kind of beside the point of, of what we're doing. Um, you know, you could, you could rewrite this scene from the, the point at which she enters the cell and, and take all the detail out before it, etc, etc. But I think what, what we can learn here tonight is that you can write a story like this um, without having to resort to modern stylistic choices about showing and telling, um, and still have an engaging story that talks about character in a way that's quite surprising. I think that's the, that's the takeaway here, it's that um, modern trends will come and go, and, and people may look back on the stories that we write right now in our show don't tell mantra and they'll come away from it thinking oh it was so weird back then we write differently now maybe so then we have to ask ourselves what makes this story effective and why and how does it convey all these things keeping in mind that emma asks specifically about the character like how how do you make an interesting character without getting them to talk so why don't we read on I think we've talked enough about this top section. <laughs> no time for distracting the lie bird. No, that's that's all right. You can you can lurk, you can work, you can do whatever you want. So the last thing that happens here is um, she resigns herself to the fact that. She's going to be flogged in public, and she tries to sort of uh, breathe through this crack in the door. The very last thing that happened was that she projected, the narrator went into her head and projected out the memory. Um, into the headlands, um, the sheep shearing, the church courtyard, great, at the key. Such thoughts produced a surprising change in her expression. Okay, so... This may... I won't comment about that yet. Such thoughts produced a surprising change in her expression. I'm going to move closer to the microphone, sorry. There, I can do the microphone voice. From behind the fair hair fallen over graceful shoulders and sleek neck framed by a crude muslin collar looked a face that was quite astonishing not only for its beauty but also for the strange intensity in the eyes, an appeal so gently and almost courteously denied by the mouth's civilised full smile, half smile. Yet there was uncertainty in the face, even in tentativeness, a surprising and alarming force. That was her. that's her, that's the character's description. What, a, what an unusual... She longed for the, the comforting arms of her father. His agony was certainly as great as her own, as he blamed himself for her present ordeal. It had been his idea that she go into service at Eden Castle, a good future for you, Marianne, he had said, the only reasonable option for a young woman. She groaned aloud and longed to comfort him. Although she knew his comforters were all around him, that the low ceilinged cottage Fairly was bursting with commiserating friends and neighbours, all dreading the ordeal of the morning as much as she. Her gentle features contorted quickly, she reversed her last thought. No, not as much as she, for their backs would not be bared, nor their arms bound in tight embrace of the whipping oak. The flesh of their foreheads would not be ground into the tar-covered bark, nor their nerves and muscles resisting the cutting lash of the whip. The full horror of the ordeal swept over her. She made a curious sound as though she had already sustained the blows of the whip. Her arms lifted over her head. Her fingers went forward, hesitated, and trembled as if they had found the comfort of a hand in the dark. The crying mouth tasted the grit of the stone floor. The tears continued for some time, a small indulgence, a smaller comfort. Laboring under the weight of her own remorseless visualizations, she fell into a stupefied exhaustion. 
Outside, she heard the faint, deep voice of the night watchman calling, All is well. Her tear-stained face now seemed possessed of a stubborn, cataleptic calm. Ooh, um, all was not well, not yet. I'm gonna be honest, I've never seen that word before. So let's define it. Like, cataclysmic? That's what it sounds like. Catalepsy is a nervous condition characterized by muscular rigidity and fixity of posture regardless of external stimuli, as well as decreased sensitivity to, to pain. So it's not quite catatonic, I think it's the opposite. Catalep catalepsy. I think the antonym is, yeah, catatonic. Abruptly, she lifted herself upward, first drawing a deep breath of clean air from the door. Then slowly she crawled forward on hands and knees as though she were a supplicant suffering in suffering some inscrutable wish for salvation, stopping at last at the very edge of, a, of the charnel wall, charnel well. She knelt, gasping for breath. The clean air from the door had depleted in her lungs. Still kneeling, she forced herself from the dying, dying light to look over the edge on, and down. The features of her face set, as though convinced of this abrupt necessity. Something in her body commensurate with the weight in her mind, where reason was inexact, forced her to look down at the rotting liquid carcasses of cattle and sheep with stiffened legs, swollen, exploded bellies, entrails like red snakes and shimmering piles amid blood-encrusted hides. She forced herself to look closer until, in the semi-darkness, she found it. A human hand, a human torso, a human head cradled in the burst brains of an animal. Glassy eyes, distended, mouth agape, frozen in a scream at the exact moment the poisonous air had suffocated him. Drawing back from the edge, she closed her eyes. The Corwellian was beyond her prayers, yet she prayed anyway, and her prayer was monstrous, because in it there was no sign of forgiveness. For the man walking somewhere in the upper regions of Eden Castle, who had put her in this place, she felt no compassion. Mm, she prayed only for the Corwellian and for herself. After the prayer, she moved farther back from the edge of the charnel well. She felt a sharp pain in the pit of her stomach, the result of breathing the poisonous air, shuddering in a double pain of poison and fury. Shuddering in a double pain of poison and fury. She crawled back to the door. For three or four minutes, she lost herself. Where she had gone, she had no idea. When she came to, she was pressed against the crack beneath the door. She did not wonder what had happened. She said aloud, there's nothing in this place of which I need be afraid. For the rest of the night, she held her terror at bay with that gentle thought, mis with that gentle though misleading smile. Very unusual. This part here especially, such thoughts um, of her mother and father and, and uh, the death of her mother produced a surprising change in her expression from behind the fair hair fallen over graceful shoulders and sleek neck framed by a crude muslin co collar like a face that was quite astonishing not only for its beauty but also for the strange intensity in the eyes and appeal so gently and almost courteously denied by the mouth's civilized half smile that's an enormous monster of a sentence my goodness wow and there are a couple of them like that as well um Modern writing would, would, would see this detail flipped around and have another character look at this character and talk about their muslin collar and looks and how it makes them feel. For the narrator to do, to do this is quite odd. Now, it sort of feeds into what I, I was noticing up here before about the narrator talking about the character details and personality traits through and around and outside the character. Yet I can't really explain this and what it means. If this wasn't here, I wouldn't lose anything about her. And that's from a modern perspective where we're, it's drilled into us that we don't 
and shouldn't need particular descriptions of what she looks like. Um, but I, I, it, it's in this story, and it's a it's it is what it is. Whether it needs to be here or not is is another matter. So I'm not sure what I can say about this paragraph here, or what we can learn from it as modern writers. This is stronger, and I, I wish this was was here, because we've gone from imagining a mother and father in the courtyard to she longed for the comforting arms of her father, which is a really nice uh, tie-in to what was going on before. This is a funny... Uh, no, sorry, not, not this. Um... She thinks so. This detail ties in with her father. Uh, she's going to be in a lot of pain. The full horror made, makes her do this this very unusual kind of like rigor mortis style contortion. Again, as before. Um, as before, this detail here helps us understand the characters. Not a charter. And their sense of self. In fact, the these details here about what she um, when she chooses to The following paragraph solidifies it solidifies this whole notion of character through detail. Um, the narrator and thus the character spend a whole lot of time focusing on the pile of corpses. Whoops, excuse me. Why? Well, I think it... I think it tells us something about how she sees the world and, and what, she's, what she's doing. Um... This para this here, her response is telling, isn't it? How she chooses to see her situation and what she does on account of the predicament she is in. Without her really talking, she talks to herself, that's, that's neither here nor there. Without her interacting with the character, we get a real sense of who she is. Look, this is a very unusual start to a story. All that happens is that a woman gets thrown into a cell. And yet we spend 1690 something words? Yeah, 1694. We spend 1694 words here on a very singular focus for the story. Yet we know quite a lot about her, she's... We know snippets of her life, how she reacts physically in these dangerous situations, how she responds to fear, whether she seeks revenge or not. All of these details come through, sometimes explicit, and sometimes hinted at detail within the story. So if you want to write like this, just for fun or to try it out, or if you want the point of view exercise, 
then consider that as the big takeaway from this this whole excerpt here. If you want to try and use this POV for your own story and keep the, the epic fantasy style on the presence narration, then <clears throat> you need to play with detail in a different manner. Showing versus telling becomes something else, something different. It's it's idea through detail. To think about it in a similar paradigm. What this means is that your details in the story, the outright declarative statements that you put in can be used to double effect. They paint the world and they talk about the character in parallel. Oh hey Emma! <laughs> you overslept. Oh dear. How, 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 how could, how could do? I'm, I'm, I'm in, in no way offended at all. Because <laughs> as, as Real Sayaka says, yay sleep. And I am in 100% agreement. I'd, I'd rather, rather sleep. And I'd rather you, you got a good night's sleep too. Or slept in and overslept. Um. Because there's always backups, you can always watch the replay of, of, of this um, on YouTube as well. If you go into my YouTube channel, it'll be there, and on Twitch here too. So you've actually joined me at a really good point, because I'm finishing up soon. <laughs> I've read through all the story, I've made lots of comments, and I've done some painting. Look, colours, yay! Um, I really recommend going back and listening to what I've been talking about. I feel that I've, I've spoken a lot on what this story is and um, using your email as a guide, I decided to, I suppose, take a, um, a different approach to tonight's stream. So yeah, definitely recommend going back to read it, <laughs> read it, sorry, to, to listen to it. Um, Because tonight's edit certainly wasn't a a typical edit. It's not a, a line by line, this is wrong, that's wrong kind of edit. It's more about examining how a story functioned 41 years ago, how the narration interfaced with the characters, how the details were being used to construct character and scenery. So you've, you've caught me at a really good point here because I'm about to make a little summary. Um, so if you want to try and use this point of view for your own story and keep the epic fantasy style omnipresence narration, it, it's, this is sort of what I, what I think it's like. Uh, you need to play with detail in a different manner. So showing versus telling becomes something different. It's sort of like... sort of like idea through detail, to think about it in a similar paradigm. What this means is that your details in the story, the outright declarative statements that you put in, can be used to double effect. They can paint the world, the scenery, and they can talk about the character. So when... Um, that tells 
you what she's like as a person. Now, this is kind of an obvious kind of statement, but the way that this is, this is written, what appears to be just a fact is actually a, a bit more. It's, it's something underneath it. When she chooses to stare at the pile of corpses on the well, that tells you she is facing her fears. When the narrator dips into her memory, oh, that's that's the next point here. Um, the the fluid vocalization can be used to really good effect if you want to say dip down into a character's memory. Switch A R A C and. Um, this happens in, um, here, which I will mark, um, the paragraph highlighted in green. Um, really good way to demonstrate character traits is through their memory and what they consider to be important events. Yep. No, that's okay. Don't, wor don't worry about it. Don't worry. Um. Yeah, and I think there were a couple of other points too, but uh, I'm having trouble recalling them. Mm. But yeah, definitely go and um, and rewatch because I think you'll find this really interesting. Um, just have a think. So you said that um, You really wanted to write like this and not rely on dialogue to make the character come alive. And I think the really interesting way that the author's done that without using much dialogue or really any dialogue is that the character does feel alive in just how much detail goes into their physicality in describing their physical presence within the cell, how they react, what their bodies are doing, whether they... Um, yeah, I talked a bit about that here. Um, so for example, how she reacts to being locked in the cell. Does she curl up in a ball? Does she bang on the wall? Does she go and stare out the window? That kind of detail is really good for telling you about the character. Um, now if you don't mind, I might, I might stop. I'm sorry tonight was a bit short. We've only been going for about an hour and 26 minutes and 50 seconds. My apologies. Ooh, wow, I have dropped a lot of frames. Um, give me one sec. No, I'm on the right Wi-Fi. That's weird. Maybe my reception's been dripping in and out. I'm very sorry if my face has been kind of... Uh, Static key. I've I've dropped se several thousand frames tonight. Um, yeah. Let me let me um give me feedback about whether my face was too ugly and uh, uh, pixelated or I, I'm, I'm I think it just chops in and out when when the stream dips. So my apologies if the stream quality has been a bit weird. Um, I I didn't even think to check. Yes, yeah, my pleasure, Emma. Um. Yeah, let me know what you think about the edit when you rewatch it, and feel free to ask any questions you like, um, either through email or pop into my Discord, actually. Um, just come and, come and say hi, and uh, I've pasted the link to this story here, so if you like, we can have a bit of a chat about it as well, if you have any more questions about what the author's done and how they've painted the character. Uh, I want feedback on my face. <laughs> 
thank you, Sekod. Yeah, I, 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 I left myself wide open there. Um, next stream. Uh, I don't know. Um, I need to think about it, and I'm probably not going to stream on Sunday. Uh, again, I will let you guys know probably tomorrow if I can do Sunday or not. Um, regardless, I will scrounge around for another story. If you've got something you'd like me to edit, send it through. Otherwise, I'll go to Distractive Readers and find a story there. <laughs> That's always good. Um, yeah, do. Please, please do. Um, Discord's always, always open. Um, you don't need the Discord app to use Discord on your computer. By the way, if you're, if you're tuning in from a computer, you can just use your browser. Otherwise, yeah, it's a Discord app on your phone. <laughs> I'm trying to, to, to justify my, my flaking. <laughs> uh, it's good to know that I, I will elicit some sort of tear response from you. That's, that's good. Yeah. Just, just the right amount of, of crying. Yeah. Good, good. Excellent. Um, the... What was I going to say? Um, the link to my Discord's on my Twitch homepage, um, just underneath the, the big screen. Uh, click on the banner and welcome to the welcome to the Discord world. Um, yeah. Again, sorry if if I've dropped you to frames tonight. I wasn't paying attention on that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> So much crying. I love it. Alrighty, um, I'm gonna call it quits. Thanks for joining me guys tonight. Thank you. Um, really, really enjoyed just chatting about this and looking at all the differences. It made me really think about how writing's changed. I'd be keen to do something, something like this in the future as well. So if you've got another old, oldish story, send it through. We can chat about it. <laughs> yeah, so true. So true. So true, say God. Alrighty, thanks for joining me. We'll catch you next time. We'll catch you later. <laughs>